says God moved uh, David to number Israel. In the book of Chronicles, it says Satan moved um, uh, 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 David to number Israel. Why is this so? Well, it is a simple uh, development in terms of theology. See, when we read the Bible from uh, Genesis all the way to Revelation, there is development in the knowledge of God and the actions of God. In the early parts of the Bible, the first believers, they very much believed that there was one God in charge of everything. They did not make room for the devil. Not that he didn't exist but they did not allow their theology to account for the devil in, ev in any way. Everything began and ended with God. Like you would see in the book of Job, that at the beginning the devil is involved, but in the discussions between Job and his friends, there is no discussion about another player in the game. They are only talking about God and Job, God and Job, God and Job. Because in the development of the biblical theology, there was no a role given to the adversary, the evil one. Even though they are aware of the adversary, they are aware of the evil one, properly introduced in Genesis chapter 3. Still, in their faith, they preferred to wrestle with God for absolutely everything. That you have to keep in mind. That is why when you now reach the book of Chronicles, there has been a development in the theology of Israel. And the recorders, the, the scribes recording the Chronicles, the history of kings, they are now more aware that to charge God with calamity or to charge God with evil doing is not a complete picture of representing God's role in what is happening. Okay, so when they record, they are now clear to say it is the adversary that moved a, a, a David to be arrogant. And, ad, and in his arrogance, because he was a very successful military ruler, David decided to number the nation, in particular the army, so that it may be seen that he is a mighty man who leads a mighty nation. Now, the two do not contradict. The two represent perspectives in theological development. And often I have always said that the two are equally applicable. As much as we know the devil is there, as much as we know that he causes problems, we ought to spend none of our time focusing on him and his actions. Because at the end of the day, life begins and ends with God. Regardless of what the devil may intend to do, Ultimately, our lives are in the hands of God. When the devil succeeds, it is because the God, God allowed. And if God allows, it is because he's got a plan to heal, to take through, to sustain, to restore, to do whatever is necessary in that situation. So there is no contradiction in the texts. Simply a broader revelation of the players that are in um, this particular story. Okay, now because of this event, General Joab says to David, Look, my king, if this is about numbers, may the Lord increase Israel a hundred times more. And may God cause you to see this in your own lifetime. But don't do this. In other words, Joab is aware. Something is not right. Israel is not the kind of nation that trusts in numbers. They trust in God and God alone. But the Bible says the word of the king prevailed. So Joab commanded the generals of the army the captains to go out throughout the land 
performing a census of the whole nation. When the census was done, the Bible says, uh, among their findings, nine months later, they found that Israel had 800,000 strong military capable men. And so this would exclude boys, this would exclude the old men who can no longer participate in war. This is just the number of the men who are able to fight. Of course, it also includes men who are sick and uh, uh, situations of that nature. It excluded women as well. So the story does not give us the detail of the entire census simply because that is not the focus. Now then God comes to David. And this is when God comes to David, David then realizes, I've made a huge mistake. When the Spirit of God visits him to question, why would you do this? Why would you count the people of Israel and number them? Why would you do this? And the answer, before we even get it, then David realizes he's wrong and cries to God and says, I have made this huge mistake. Please forgive me. And God says to him, look, for what you have done, there is a punishment. And God gives him three options. And again, when you read the two versions, you will find a bit um, of differences in terms of how the punishment is laid out. In the book of uh, 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 Samuel chapter 24, you find that God says to him, will it be seven years of famine? Will it be three months uh, of being pursued by your enemies? or three days being punished by the hand um, of God. And when you get to the book of Chronicles, it says, will it be three years of famine, three months uh, of uh, being defeated by your foes, or three days. So the difference there is that in Samuel, the famine is seven years, and of course, in, 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 uh, in the book of Chronicles, the, 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 the famine is three years. In terms, again, of the accuracy, the theology of the story, we have no credibility issues. It is a matter of differentiating in terms of uh, 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 the time span. And again, there could be a, a, a reason to it. The first one could be that the recorder looks not so much at the years of the famine, but that because the famine comes from the hand of God, it will be a perfected punishment, and so they default into the seven approach. And the other one focuses on the three years of famine because there's a possibility that they want to make a link with the deliverance that God gave Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet. Do you remember the three-year famine that ended when, when, when Elijah then intervened? So there may be a connection of deliverance that even though the famine may come, deliverance is still going to be granted by the intervention of God. Okay? And when we read this text, I'm somebody who... Uh, spends a lot of time on Old Testament studies. And, and I've found that uh, most people struggle to understand what we call developmental theology. In other words, as you read the Bible, uh, things are not necessarily quickly complete and perfect. People are understanding a portion and then God adds more and then they understand more and the Bible keeps growing and growing and growing. So you may see that as the stories are recorded, they don't contradict. More is added as more is understood and articulated by the prophets about what God was intending to teach um, in that particular story. So, David then says... This one, I know what to do. He says, if I have to choose between being pursued by our enemies or a famine or the hand of God, I choose the hand of God. Now, I want you to notice something very important here that uh, uh, is present in the Old Testament that I want us to bring out. You see, between these three, the famine 
the pursuit of the enemies, and the hand of God. In terms of power, in terms of power, the hand of God is the most powerful in destroying. What would follow is the famine. It would kill in millions. And lastly, the enemy. Though they would attack, but they would, there would be a way for, for the Israelites to fight and try and defend themselves. So if you look at the categories, they present the possibilities of defense. Let's, let's just look at them. If, for example, David chooses a famine, defending yourself against a famine is a bit difficult because it is natural, it strikes the land. Your only option is to try and save food before the famine comes. In this case, they won't have a chance because as soon as David chooses it, it begins. They have no stored food, okay? The other option is to then go to your neighbors and ask for food. Who may help, but they need to prioritize themselves as well. So you may not get as much food as you need. So in a famine, there is a possibility to try and fight back, but you are highly limited. In a war, if he chooses option two, to allow the enemies to overrun them for three months, well, there's a very much higher possibility of success than in the famine. At least Israel has an army, they have chariots, they have shields, they've got spears. They'll be able to fight. They'll be defeated because God is allowing the enemy, yes, but they would still put up a very good fight. The enemy will not just run over them. So in terms of defensibility, the option of taking uh, being pursued by your enemy was actually the highest and best. Of course, the, op the option to take, to take God's hand is the worst. Because there is no way you can defend yourself when God is coming for you. So if we were to analyze the option on the basis of defendability, God is absolutely out. You don't want to take God to punish you. Even if it's three hours, let alone three days, you don't want that. There is zero chance of defense. You don't want a famine, although it is horrible, but it is better than God. If you had to choose between God and the famine, rather take the famine. But the famine is natural. You have very little influence on nature. So the best choice here actually is to say, Lord, hand us over to our enemies. Because we can fight. We've got weapons. We can at least deal with this issue. Uh, we've got some capacity to defend ourselves. David takes the worst option in terms of power. He chooses the worst. He says, if we have to suffer, God, I choose you. That's the problem. If I was there and I was listening, I would have said, what is wrong with you? You have chosen the one option where we have zero ability to survive. I would have said to him, did you not read about Noah's flood? Did you not read about Sodom and Gomorrah? Did you not read about Korah and his rebellion? Do you not know what happens when God is coming for you? I would have said to David, no, choose another option. If God is going to be punishing us, we are doomed. But David, David knew something very powerful about God that every Christian must know. And what is that? And it is very simple. No matter how powerful God is, when it comes to punishing, the man is a loser. His love and mercy outweighs his power. And that is what David knew. So David says, if we have a choice, number one, we begin there. 
already God betrays how merciful he is by offering a choice. Why did he not just discipline them in the first place? Why did he offer a choice? Because right there God was already revealing, I don't desire to punish you. So though I have to punish you, I will give you the ability to stop me from punishing you. I will give you a choice. And in these choices, in this multiple choice question, I hope you choose right, David. Now you understand, the things of God require faith. They require wisdom from above. Because logic would have said, choose to be pursued by the army. You can defend yourself. But faith said, choose God. He may be the most powerful in the list, but he is also the most merciful, the most loving, the most kind, the most patient, the slowest to anger, but quick to forgive. It is not only David who knew this. Jonah also knew this. In chapter 4, when the Ninevites were not destroyed, Jonah repeated it. I knew that you are a loving God, slow to anger, quick in mercy, forgiving. Let me be very clear, dear friends. Should you choose, should you choose in whose hands your life must be when your eternity is determined, you better choose God. You better choose God. Maybe let me say something here that might shock some of you. God is so merciful. Do you understand that there's a possibility that even hell might not be there? That the devil may end up being the only one in it. Because in every story in the Bible, whenever God has to deliver his judgment, we always, always find him saying, Oh, but Israel, how can I do this to you? How can I punish you, my people? Many of us may be surprised. In fact, if you read Revelation 20, why do you think right at the end, 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 you still hear Revelation 20 says, when, that, when those who were left behind after the millennium, remember, when the millennium ends, and we, Christ returns before the earth is destroyed. These people have already been judged. They are not in heaven. But why do you in Revelation 20 here, the Bible says, the dead were raised and the book of life was opened again. Why reopen the book when they have already been judged? Is this not God sending a message that it is possible that I may choose to exercise mercy again and save because it is in me to save. It is in me to be merciful. And David knew this. I wonder if you know this about God. When you are preaching sermons that scare and terrify people and take away hope, I wonder if you know the God you are preaching about. Because the God we are reading about here is always merciful. And the Bible tells us that David said, I know my choice. I know my choice if I have to choose. I cannot leave myself in the hands of nature. Nature has no heart. Nature has no soul. Nature cannot feel pain. Nature will do as it pleases. I cannot leave my fate in the hands of human beings. Human beings are cruel. Human beings will enjoy to kill us. Rather, I choose God. I choose God. Because even in Sodom and Gomorrah, he said to Abraham, Give me ten. Give me ten and I'll save. Because even in the flood, he said, 
if you repent, I will relent. And for 120 years, no one repented. You see, it is in the nature of God to always save. It is always his choice that there should be somebody who receives grace. That is why he ended up dying for us. Because he is so obsessed with saving us. When he realized that we won't choose salvation, he made a choice to choose it for us. When he realized that we are too stupid to take advantage of his mercy, when he realized we are too arrogant to realize how much we need grace, he chose to die so that he may buy for us what we would have never taken for ourselves. And so, David says, if I have a choice, I take you. I take you. And the Bible says, then an angel descended from heaven. And the angel began to ravage through Israel. And that one day alone, 70,000 men died. Let us ask this question. First, what was wrong in the first place about counting? What had David done that is wrong? Was David the first to count Israel? And the answer is no. Moses counted the Israelites in the wilderness. Why was Moses not punished? The answer lies here. When Moses counted them, read the story of the census of Moses in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, Moses did not count the Israelites by number. He counted them by family names. That is very powerful. In the end, Moses did not pronounce a number. He pronounced them by their family names, by their tribes. David counted them by number. Have you figured out the mystery yet? When God was taking the Israelites out of Egypt, what did he say? He says, I now attach the name of the Lord upon you. He says, Jehovah shall be his name, mighty in victory, and his name shall be a banner to Israel. What had Moses done right? Israel belongs to God. When you count Israel, count them by name because it is the name of the Lord that rules over them. Do not count them by number. Why? Because he delivered them from many gods when he was one God. For that reason, he is a God who despises might by numbers. He has might by name, not might by numbers. David made a mistake. He counted them by numbers, not by the name of the Lord. And God is not mighty in numbers. He is mighty in name. He is Jehovah, mighty in battle, not mighty in an army. That is where David had failed. One ought to be very careful when reading this story. Because this story warns all of us. Do not reduce God's people to numbers. You are offending their creator. People must be counted by the name of God. And people must be counted by the name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus. Now you see this message doesn't make sense to us. We live in a capitalist world. In a capitalist world, we are nothing but a number. No one cares. Go to the South African Revenue Services, I am a number. Go to Home Affairs, I am a number. Go to any department in government, I am a number. That's all I am. Even in the books of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I have an employee number. We live in a world of numbers. We do not understand the God who says, numbers don't apply here. What applies is the name that is above every other name. That is why even in our relationships, 
we reduce ourselves to numbers. You will hear young men talking, how many girls have you dated? The other one will say eight. Because you do not recognize the life that God gives to those girls. You only recognize the number of what you have taken away. That's the problem with us. We live by numbers. When we meet each other, what is the first thing we want? Give me your number. Let's share our contacts. Because you don't want to know who I am. You want a number. This is the world we live in. A world of numbers. It's all about a number. When we boast, we don't boast about our characters. We boast about how much do I earn. How many rooms are in my house? What is the valve engine on my car? How many cars do I have? What speed number does it reach? We are a people of numbers. We do not understand the God who attaches a name. The world has fallen apart because it doesn't understand the God who treats people for who they are. Not how many they are. God doesn't care about numbers. He cares about the content of a person. And because we live in a world that doesn't care about the content of character, we just number people. That's all we do. Even pastors do the same. They don't know who church members are, but they know you by your tithe. Because it's about a number. Church pastors will look at the church books when the treasurers have ticked who returns a tithe. And when they see who is in the tithe and offerings book, you get a home visitation. When you are not in the books, no one cares your struggles. No one cares why are you not returning. Because we live in a world of numbers. Even in this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, we don't ask about character when we elect leaders. We look whether they return a tithe. Even God's church has betrayed him. It cares about numbers. David was rebuked by God when he reduced God's people to number. The world is not a number. It belongs to God Almighty. And when you meet people, don't you dare reduce them to a number. See them for who they are. But what is worse is David betrayed God because David himself was chosen by God to be a king when the numbers were against him. Do you remember that David was the last born? The numbers were not on his side. But God told Samuel, do not look at the number. Look at the character. For God looks at the heart. Today, today David has the nerve to use a number when he was chosen by the name. That is why God was angry. I took you, David, when numbers were against you, and I made you a king. Today, you reduce my people to a number. How many of us were nothing, born in poverty, in colonized economies, oppressed because of our skin, but God heard our cries, delivered us, took us through school, took us through universities, gave us jobs, gave us companies. Today, today, we judge the poor by number. When we were delivered, even though the numbers were not on our side, beware, one a rabbi of the Jews writing somewhere in the 900s AD says, in front of every person, there is an angel of God walking, shouting, make way, make way for the image of God. This rabbi was saying basically, when you meet a person, 
Meet the God who created them before you meet them. Lest you disrespect them and forget there's a God who had a plan and a purpose for this person. And so, listen to this. David had not even cried yet. The angel had just killed 70,000. It is not David who cried. It's the angel who then say, who it's God rather, who then says to the angel, stop, it is enough. You have done enough. This was day one, but it was supposed to be three days. Now do you see David chose well. We are safer in the hands of God because God is so loving and so merciful that even if we deserve the three days of punishment, just on day one, just on day one, there is a question you may ask that David also asked. Did these 70,000 people deserve to die? And my answer to you is very simple. In the Old Testament, we deal with a sovereign God, almighty and all-powerful, exercising his judgments without any question. There is no one on this earth who will ever explain to you why these 70,000 had to die for the sin of David. But God will answer you at Calvary by dying himself so that he may feel what he has taken us through. At the cross, Jesus felt the death of those 70,000 people which he killed. He killed in the book of Samuel. Now, the death of Jesus at the cross is not about just the atonement of sins. It is also about God paying the price for the decisions he made in the Old Testament, which were painful to us. He absorbs that pain at the cross as a form of not only atoning for our sins, but atoning also for himself in the pain that we have gone through. And then, the same angel that has now stopped killing, then flies and stands on top of the property of Arwana the Jebusite to show David that you have been forgiven, but someone needs to atone. In other words, you were supposed to be punished for three days, but you've been punished for one. Who pays for the other two days? Because God has been offended and atonement must be made. When we read the story, the Bible says, then David went to Arwana and said, give me your threshing floor so that I pay for the atonement. It is easy to think that the atonement was in the cows. It is easy to think that the atonement was in the 50 shekels of silver David paid. But if that is what you think, then we would have missed something important. Did we not listen to Arwana say to David, may God accept you? That line is very powerful. David was offering bulls. Why did Arwana not say, may God accept your offering? Why did Arwana say, may God accept you? For one reason, Arwana is taking us to the cross that the true atonement shall not come by cows and bulls, but it shall come through a living descendant of David. A human being must die. But not just a human, one who is enough to appease God, and only God can appease God. So the one who must be acceptable must be God and man at the same time. No wonder then after Jesus resurrected, he says to the disciples, do not touch me. I have not yet gone to the Father. And then Revelation chapter 5 says, finishing that story, then I saw the lamb that was slain entering 
And when he entered the heavens, they sang, Worthy is the Lamb, because the sacrifice of atonement has been accepted by the heavens. Dear saints, I want you to know that if in this world should you choose where to fall, fall in the hands of the merciful and loving God. Fall in the hands of the atoning and loving Savior. I bring you good news wherever you are. Mercy is the default of God. Grace is the default of God. God will always exercise mercy and favor towards his children. We have no reason to fear God. He is not out to destroy us. He is out to find every possible way to forgive us. Let us pray. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are grateful for a Savior and a God such as you. And this day, we make it clear, we choose you. We choose the cross of Calvary. We choose your hands. For there is no one as merciful and as loving as you. No one as gracious, as patient as you. If we are asked now in this world of pain and suffering, whom do we choose? We confirm Jesus. We choose you and no one else but you. In your name, Jesus, we have prayed. Amen.